Good evening. Welcome to our webinar this evening from Ohio's North Coast. Tonight, we're kicking off a new series called Conservation Conversations. We created this virtual series to build awareness on topics that affect our environment and the communities in which we live. Having a solid background on these issues allows us to be better stewards in protecting and preserving our natural resources. I am Renee Baranka, the Manager of Conservation Education and Outreach at Western Reserve Land Conservancy. At the Land Conservancy, I plan nature-based programming, both virtually and in person, for people of all ages, often utilizing the expansive network of conservation properties the Land Conservancy has protected in Northeast Ohio, which totals close to 70,000 acres of natural landscapes, family farms, and urban green spaces. I first learned about the perils of city lights to birds over 10 years ago when Harvey presented at a Lake Erie Allegheny Partnership meeting. Back then, the program was called Smart Light, Safe Flight. I recall being blown away at the sheer numbers of birds that were dying because of their attraction to lights during migration. Great strides have been made in the last decade, but there's still work to be done. And I hope tonight's presentation increases your awareness on this critical topic. During tonight's presentation, please place your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. We'll get to as many as we can if time permits. It's my pleasure to introduce Harvey Webster. Harvey is the retired Chief Wildlife Officer and Emeritus Ambassador of the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, where he dedicated almost half a century to educating the public on the marvels of our natural world, from Dunkelosteus to Lucy to Balto to Bald Eagles. In his retirement, he continues to reach the masses to protect our avian friends and can often be found on stage rocking it out with his band, Fat City. Welcome, Harvey. Um, we conduct humane collection, treatment, rehabilitation, and release of stunned birds that collide with buildings downtown, salvaging the dead specimens and incorporating them into the research collections of the Clean Museum of Natural History. Um, and then from those data sets um, that are so extraordinarily assembled by the volunteer monitors, um, apply those results in that data to conservation science and help to advance our knowledge and understanding of timing, composition, breadth, and mechanics of nocturnal mo bird migration through this region. And we'll talk about it a little bit later, but there's actually been scientific papers that have been published that have been based in part on lights out data from Cleveland. So um, this is contributing to a better understanding of what's happening with certain birds, particularly the ones that utter call notes in flight. Um, Lights Out Cleveland promotes citizen science because the heart and soul of this is a monitoring program and everyone is a volunteer. Um, ably coordinated by um, uh, Tim Jasinski from Lake Erie Nature and Science Center and Liz McQuaid. There's an extraordinary group of people that are out there day in and day out in spring and fall migration that are doing their routes through downtown Cleveland. We, it's not a comprehensive census of all the streets in downtown. We try, we try and do exactly the same routes so that there's scientific integrity to the data that we find. But it's entirely based upon um, those monitors who are all volunteers. At its heart, Lights Out Cleveland is all about promoting urban sustainability, but sustainability writ large, the notion that um, you know, sustainability isn't just about energy conservation. Um, it's not about just you know, how effectively we use water and recycle waste and all the rest. It's really about the context of our cities and the biological phenomena that happen in and over and around them. And what are we doing to provide a friendly, a bird friendly and a safe space, in this case for migratory birds or other organisms as they come through the, the city on their, um, these you know, migrations that they've been doing for time memorial. And then also in that light, we're trying to make Cleveland and our region bird friendly and safe for migratory birds. So that's kind of what we do, but this is, again, the only 
the only guy that really is is paid to oversee this is Matt Schumer as the coordinator of Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative. And then others in the organization um, that are active are doing so um, with respect to the specific talents or skills or resources of their respective organizations. Um, again, I said it's part of a, a, an Ohio Lights Out program, and these are the collaborators within the state of Ohio. You have Lights Out Cincinnati, Lights Out Miami Valley in the Dayton area, Bird Friendly Toledo, Lights Out Columbus, Lights Out Cleveland. So um, this is a, it's a, been a great initiative on the part of Matt to try and um, uh, make uh, bridges to groups in all of these cities to get their Lights Out programs up and running. And we're going to get to why we need Lights Out and what this is all about in a bit. But first, birds in the city. So when we think about birds in the city, I mean, there are a lot of birds in the city. Matter of fact, there's a lot of birds that are very happy living in the city, um, the rock pigeon being one of them, uh, particularly birds that adapt well to the human landscape. Um, we now have peregrine falcons nesting in numerous sites in downtown Cleveland on bridges and on skyscrapers um, and down in the uh, industrial heart of the city. We've got um, a rather amazing conglomeration of gulls uh, that probably reach their peak in the winter months, particularly when Lake Erie freezes up and all the gulls move into, late, uh, into the Cuyahoga River. But there are huge numbers of ringbill gulls in particular and herring gulls that nest. They nest on slag piles by the steel mills. And um, not a lot of those nests are allowed to be successful, but it's just a, a huge resource. I mean, it, it brings to mind the movie, The Birds, because if you, know, you had a, a particular fear about massing birds, uh, certainly downtown Cleveland along the Cuyahoga in the wintertime could be your worst nightmare. Um, but we find other birds too. And by the way, the gulls have a kind of a curious, just as, as an aside, back in the, the late aughts, they were having some issues with gulls that were gathering out in center field at um, Progressive Field. And the, the deal was about the seventh inning or so, gulls would start landing on the field. And everyone thought, well, this is kind of cute. You know, look, we got gulls on the field. Until one night we were playing the Kansas City Royals and a Cleveland batter hit a well-struck ball. It was a tie game that went careening out, um, a ground ball careening out to center field. And Coco Crisp, who used to be an Indian, but at the time was playing with uh, Kansas City, came in to field the ball, which he would have done handily, except the ball hit one of the gulls, went careening off in another direction, and the Indians won the game. And the next day, Major League Baseball was calling the Indians saying, do something about your gull problem. And of course, the gulls were there because they were trying to get a jump on when the game was over, they could get up in the stands and eat the popcorn and the hot dogs and whatever other detritus was left over by all of the fans there. So, I mean, birds have, have actually, it was the one and only time I was interviewed on ESPN, believe it or not, was all about the gulls um, and uh, Jacobs Field, or Jacobs Field then, now Progressive Field. Um, we frequently see Things like wild turkeys roaming up and down Martin Luther King Jr. Drive or stopping traffic on Lee Road up in Cleveland Heights. And I mean, there's just an awful lot of birds that have made the city their home. Um, we see some extraordinary adaptation of raptors to our communication towers. Uh, ospreys nesting in Ohio seem to prefer communication towers over any other um, substrate for a place to build a nest. And uh, apparently turkey vultures get their best reception on um, cell phone towers. So we see these birds, some of them large, like the turkey vultures that gather in our midst. So we've got lots of birds around us and a lot of birds seem to be doing, doing extremely well, particularly things like the Canada goose. Though I will direct your attention to the image um, in the upper left, that's actually an arrow through the neck of that Canada goose. I was doing my best to try and catch it, but Apparently, the arrow um, did not impede its ability to escape me. And then you see evidence of, of Canada geese that are nesting on gravel top roofs, which, of course, gulls do. And there's a whole other slew of, of uh, organisms that take advantage of, of these resources that we make available. And there's a lot of biomass out there. But in terms of the, the overall numbers of birds, it's a drop in the bucket. And there's a whole other crew of birds. The migratory birds, 
that maybe we don't find in the city of Cleveland very often. This is a chestnut-sided warbler, upper left, black-throated uh, black green warbler, upper right, black burning warbler, and a black-throated blue warbler. These guys are the feathered jewels of the forest, and they move through like many other migratory species in, in broad waves across the landscape, driven by favorable winds and hormones to get north to their breeding grounds in the spring. And they do almost all of that migration at night. There's many reasons for them to do that, that, that why this might have evolved free of predators. If you're flying maybe up to 1,000 to 2,000 feet, you're above most ground clutter and um, they can navigate by the stars, they can orient by the Earth's magnetic field, they can use polarized light and, and geographic clues. So they're well suited for flying at night. Um, and then when you get to dawn, they make landfall, they look for a place to grab a meal and rest um, before they, they start carrying on, prepare for the next evening. And this is the birds that we're really concentrating in our lights out Cleveland. I mean, we, we want Cleveland to be a bird friendly uh, city for all species, but it's these birds in particular. And what's curious about it is that most people are totally unaware that they're moving over or through um, the city of Cleveland. Um, if you go and bird the Erie Street uh, Cemetery, you'll see lots of these guys in, um, in May um, as they're passing through. But for most other folks, they're oblivious to it because the movement is generally happening at night. Um, this is a graphic from uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology that just tried to calculate utilizing tons and tons of radar data, um, what was the aggregate number of birds that were migrating north in the spring and coming south in the fall? And you see that uh, that southern transect, um, you've got roughly three and a half billion birds moving from Central and South America into the US and north, about 2.6 of them moving on into Canada. And in the fall, when you've got all the youngsters, You've got 4 billion passing over the Canadian boundary, the northern transect, and 4.7 billion birds heading on into Mexico. So these are huge numbers. And this is one of the coolest and greatest phenomena on planet Earth is these hemispheric migrations of uh, migratory birds. One of the ways we know so much about them is because of NEXRAD Doppler radar. And this is an image taken um, on the 3rd of October in 2010. And it was um, taken at a time when you've got nightfall over the Eastern US. There's not a whole lot of weather in this image. There is right over Ohio. You can see that green weather formation and off of Hatteras and a, maybe a squall here or there. But everything else you see, that those, that blue cast around a, a Nexrad Doppler site, those are all birds. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal, the numbers of birds, and they just light up radar. When they first invented radar in the Second World War and started implementing it, they not only saw enemy planes and the like, but they would periodically see what they would call angels, a gathering of angels on the radar. And it took them a long time to figure out what they were seeing were migratory birds. And not only birds can do this, but insects can light up Doppler radar. If you get a mass of, of organisms that get high enough up in the air column, they'll light up the uh, next rad radar. So this just shows you, and, and the wonderful people at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, the, the magicians that they are, they've given us eBird, they've given us just so many amazing tools to better uh, be able to uh, appreciate birds. But they've taken this NEXRAD radar data and weather data, and they've come up with something called BirdCast. And BirdCast is a fabulous way that you can actually predict the movements of birds. And I would have done tonight's uh, BirdCast, except uh, for whatever reason, my PowerPoint wasn't accepting an update. But I'm going to activate this thing, and you just get a scent. You'll see a, a line that will come from east to west across the US. That's nightfall, that the red one will be sunset. It'll be followed sometime later by sunrise, a yellow line. But then watch what happens in the meantime. Here's sunset. And all of a sudden, the entire eastern US lights up, including Ohio, by the way. 
and you can see the directionality of the migration. This would be a, a, a bird cast where you definitely would want to have the monitors out walking the streets the next day, and here's sunrise. So it's amazing the tools that we have now that we can actually predict the kinds of movements that, that uh, we might see, and um, it's incredibly accurate, believe it or not. Um, and it's just amazing, this biological phenomena that is basically lighting up the entire United States. So this is an amazing um, phenomena. And there's a couple things is that, you know, they've been doing this, these flights, you know, certainly since the end of the last um, uh, glacial epoch, um, but some kind of migration I'm sure would predate that too. But it's interesting that they do that, they fly at night, they use time honored, well-honed routes that are probably pretty hardwired into their genetic code on how to get north and how to get south. Um, but when you take a look at the planet, and this is the famous blue marble picture taken from uh, Apollo 17 back in 1972, that sort of gave us for a first time a, a, a chance to appreciate our, our planet and um, just how wonderful and unique and blue and water vapor and just how outstanding. But afterwards, um, there was another uh, image taken that is oftentimes called the black marble. And this is a composite image assembled from data acquired from the Xiaomi NPP satellite in April and October, 2012. And it showed the Western hemisphere at night. And you see how, like, you wouldn't need to be a, you know, a really gifted astronomer if you had some fancy Hubble telescope in some other solar system looking at Earth to know that something was going on on this planet that had to do with things other than geomorphology um, of the surface. And that is that we illuminate the planet. I mean, we illuminate the night. It's sort of like the end of darkness in many places. And I mean, it, when you take a look at the U.S., it's extraordinary, all the cities that we've got and the amount of light pollution and light scatter. Now, if you're a night flying bird that you have honed your skills in the darkness, that you're relying on celestial navigation and other kinds of um, uh, environmental clues, what effect does light have on you? And that's been a big question for a lot of years. Um, I just want to take one other little tangent here, just to talk about the extraordinary nature of migration. And one of my favorite poster birds for this is the black pole warbler. And this is a, 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 a warbler that has an incredible distribution. It, it's found throughout the boreal forests, um, literally from the Canadian um, maritime provinces all the way over to Alaska. Um, they nest in Nome, Alaska, for instance, even beyond um, the, the tree level, um, the tree zone. And these birds, all of them will gravitate towards the East Coast in the fall. And they undergo this epic migration that takes them out over the Atlantic Ocean. And DeLuca et al. have come up with some amazing studies with geolocators on, um, on black pole warblers to show the nature of the movements. Now, they've got some discrete spots where you see that they they're, um, have been detected either by where they were first um, had the geolocator placed on them. But you see the, the, the actual lines that you see here are not the actual course they're taking, but it's roughly, we, we feel the directionality of where they're going. And that means that bird that hatched out of a nest in Nome, Alaska, and has never migrated before, at the end of the summer, when it's got a lot of fat on it, starts gravitating to the east, goes across the entire boreal forest of Canada, comes on down somewhere through the Great Lakes, maybe right over uh, downtown Cleveland, on its way to the Atlantic coast. Then at the Atlantic coast, they stop, they feed, they rest, they recharge, and they wait for the passage of a low pressure system that brings winds out of the Northwest. And then they use those Northwest winds as a tailwind and they take off over the open Atlantic Ocean, that trans-oceanic movement that you see at the uh, uh, center um, right. And then they fly the Atlantic and some of them might make uh, landfall in the Dominican Republic or maybe one of the 
the Caribbean islands, but others go all the way to Venezuela and they do this potentially nonstop, 88 hours of nonstop flying, a bird that weighs about the same as two nickels and a dime. It's just, it's one of the most extraordinary songbird migrations of any bird on the planet. Um, and that they do this and the reverse does not happen for them in the spring because the, the winds aren't favorable. What happens is when they leave the Atlantic coast and they go out over the open Atlantic, they've got that tailwind from the low pressure system, but at some point that's going to peter out. And then they come under the influence of the um, Northeast trade winds, which help deflect them and give them a tailwind push down to Venezuela. And it's kind of like, well, whoever told them that those winds would be out there? Because if the winds fail them, I mean, talk about an act of faith when that black pole warbler leaves the shoreline. It's no, there's no going back. Um, and it's just an amazing um, mig migratory period, uh, migratory path. And particularly when you think that they, you know, some of them are going all the way back to Nome again. And what's really sad about that is this spectacle, this extraordinary biotic spectacle that happens and has happened for so long can be stopped dead in its track by windows and buildings in downtown Cleveland. And here you see black pole warblers that have been recovered down in, in the city. And this is just one of the things that kind of breaks your heart when you think of what the bird is capable of, how long it's already flown, only to get confused in a city and strike that city, uh, strike a building and die. Um, we know in the east that the birds do fly at a lower altitude than they do in the west. And again, this is something that the Doppler, Nexrad Doppler radar is, is um, enabled folks, uh, particularly at the Lab of Ornithology to study. So we're at a thousand to 2000 feet. And you see in that little scale on the lower right, you see the, the Empire State Building for um, scale. It means that they're generally flying right above skyscraper level. Okay, what's the deal? What happens? Well, here's a picture of the city of Cleveland, well illuminated on kind of a foggy evening. And you can see there's a lot of light there. And if I'm a bird in fall migration coming over the lake, that um, I'm going to be a little bit confused by all that light scatter. And it turns out that birds seem to have a natural tendency, the night flying birds, to gravitate towards light. And this is the problem. And if you go downtown and you take a look at, at uh, how well we illuminate downtown, like the Terminal Tower and the other buildings um, that are well illuminated, and hopefully this was a picture that was taken earlier in the evening before the lights went on, um, uh, when the lights were on before hopefully the 200 public screws turning lights out at, uh, at midnight. But um, this ends up being a problem because this is really attractive. And we know a lot about this because of the tribute and light to the Venezuela. This has been happening since 2002, I believe, where they set up these, you know, ex these huge lights on the site of the Twin Towers and they cast these beams skyward. And they found in the first year that they did it that they had all of these things that looked like fireflies that were dancing around in the beams of the light. Well, they were all birds. And the birds had been captured literally by the light. They were so disoriented, they would circle the light and they found thousands of birds littering the ground the next day, um, exhausted or dead. So clearly light has an issue, uh, it is an issue to these birds. And that was further substantiated by a radar study, you, again, using NEXRAD um, uh, radar back in 2015. If you look at the image of the, uh, on the left, 10, 12 p.m., the tribute of light is turned off, and I'll talk about that in, in a second. And you have about 500 birds scattered within a half a kilometer of the site of the World Trade Center. Once the, the tribute of light turns back on, 10.32, so we're, what, 20 minutes later, there are 15,700 birds within a half kilometer, and you can see how the next red uh, radar is just lighting up on southern Ma Manhattan. Those birds are gravitating to the light. They're going out of their way to come to the light. And um, this really was a graphic uh, demonstration of the effect that light could have. Fortunately, the folks at the New York um, Audubon Society work with the folks that put on the tribute light. 
and they have spotters there um, who you can see at work here and they they gauge how many birds are trapped in the light and if there's too many then they shut the lights down for 10 minutes 10 to, to 15 minutes and then release the birds off into the night and then turn them back on again it's a great win-win because you have the tribute you know which is an important tribute to um to those victims but at the same time we're not killing birds um uh, because of it um and you know the the victims of these kinds of things i mean here's a blackburnian warbler you know a, a, a bird that's just such a glorious bird in life it's still pretty glorious in death but you know it's it's just such a needless waste because we don't really have to have lots of light in our cities now one other thing is that the impact our cities have on migratory birds comes against a backdrop of a, a, a stunning revelation, a study done by Rosenberg et al. that was um, in uh, 2019 issue of Science Magazine, where they calculated that we have experienced a 29% decline in bird populations in North America since 1970, a staggering loss of 2.9% billion birds. This is, you know, when you think about it, 1970, Earth Day number one, you know, soon after 1970, we were forming the EPA, we had the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act. We were doing all these things to intervene with critically endangered species to bring them back like eagles and peregrine falcons and California condors. But in the aggregate, and many of those birds come back, I mean, eagles are now sort of a dime a dozen. But in the aggregate, we've still had this huge loss of birds, and much of that loss is in these migratory birds that we're talking about. Now, in terms of anthropogenic or uh, man-caused um, or man-influenced causes of mortality in migratory birds, it's been calculated that cats kill 2.4 billion birds a year. That's data from Loss et al. back in 2015. Collision with buildings and glass, 599 million. Collision with vehicles, 214 million. Um, uh, pesticides, insecticides, and other um, environmental uh, contaminants, 72 million. Con collisions with electric lines, 25 and a half million. Electrocutions by electric lines, 5.6 million. And collisions with land-based wind turbines, 234,012. So you can see that the, 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 big, the big impacts are coming from cats, um, which is not our topic tonight, but if you have a cat, keep it indoors, please. But um, with building, buildings, light, and glass. So Lights Out Cleveland that we talked about um, started out as something called Smart Light, Safe Flight back in, in um, 2008. I had been to Chicago and was very impressed by Lights Out Chicago, this wonderful program they had that had the full backing of City Hall and the Building Owners and Managers Association. And every night at 11 o'clock, basically most of downtown would go dark during spring and fall migration. And it was great to see how a city rallied around that. And I thought this would be a great idea for Cleveland. I, as an aside, I had been at a Western Reserve Actually, it was a Chagrin River Land Conservancy fundraiser at the Epics House and having cocktails, um, then representative, um, uh, well, then uh, Connie Schultz, rather, um, uh, the communist for the Plain Dealer was there. And I had worked with uh, Connie on a few stories in the past. And <laughs> Connie, it was, we were talking, I had a bird of prey there I was showing off at, during cocktail hour. And um, I was telling her about this Lights Out Chicago, and I, you know, I thought, boy, this would be a great thing to have in Cleveland. And, and she said, that's a great idea. You should do it. I'd like you to do a story on it, but don't call it Lights Out Cleveland because we're a, you know, a, a, a rust bucket city with a declining manufacturing base, a declining population base. It sounds like you're turning the lights off on the city. We were influenced by that. So we came up with Smart Light Safe Flight. Um, Let's say we did get some traction with some buildings, but in the absence of a monitoring program, whenever you would try and make the case that we have birds that are colliding with our buildings, people would say, well, show me. And if you walk the streets at eight o'clock in the morning, you don't see any birds in the streets. I mean, some days when, when and we'll talk about this, the, the uh, morning feeding movements of birds, but 
mostly all of those birds that have hit the windows, if they weren't collected by the monitors of Lights Out Cleveland, would be scavenged by gulls. I mean, long before the sun comes up, the gulls are already patrolling the streets looking for things to eat. So between this, the downtown Cleveland Alliance ambassadors and the gulls and rats and whatever other scavengers might be out there, um, you probably wouldn't find a bird. They would all be consumed. Um, so it, in the absence of a monitoring program, it was hard to make the case and it was hard to get a lot of traction. Well, in 2017, um, we did a reboot um, with uh, uh, moving this under the, um, the aegis of the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative and Matt Schumer. And the kind of critical part of the missing link that we didn't have before was Tim Jasinski, um, Superman himself, who was very, very um, interested in getting a monitoring program because he had seen so many of the birds that had collided with the buildings end up over at the Lake Erie Nature and Science and Wildlife Rehabilitation Program, particularly the woodcocks. And he was just, you know, torn by this needless loss of birds. So we regrouped that year and started a monitoring program. And, and there's Tim in the middle, um, you know, in his shorts and um, a lot of other key players there. You see Jen Brumfield, you see Michelle Lighty, just a, a lot of really good people that, that, um, volunteered their time to be out um, starting March 15th and ending on June 1st. And then in the fall, starting August 15th and ending around November 1st, literally being downtown at five o'clock and walking the streets um, on prescribed routes, trying to recover the dead or the, the stunned birds on the, um, on the sidewalk. And, you know, if you're down there at five o'clock and particularly when you have conditions like this, misty conditions, this seems to bring birds uh, lower to the ground, um, that they're, they don't fly as high as they might in foggy conditions. And it seems to amplify in, uh, the, the light scatter effect and is even more disorienting on the birds. Um, and so this, this kind of rabbit worn of tall buildings and glass and light, and this is the result. There's that white-throated sparrow that we talked about being the most common victim of window collisions down downtown. And of course, you see your glass window right behind them. That was probably the offending structure and Woodcock and Nashville warblers. And, and sometimes you have so many birds colliding with a, a, a building like Key Tower, you fill a bag with birds from the one spot. Um, but the whole idea with Lights Out Cleveland is all of a tremendous amount of information is logged with each bird that's recovered. Each bird goes into a plastic bag, I mean, a paper bag. On that bag, there's the opportunity to see you know, date and the time, what's the address, what's the building, what facade of the building um, did, was the bird found. And, um, and this ended up becoming a really, really powerful database for understanding the dynamics of when the collisions are happening, because they're not all happening just at five o'clock in the morning. They didn't happen overnight. Some of them, those collisions are, are trailing on into the eight o'clock, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, and, and then if the bird was still alive, it also would go into a bag. And then those birds would be expedited out to the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. The thing about this too, is you see, you know, some really handsome birds like the indigo bunning, but you see birds like, you know, golden winged warblers, which are a species of great concern in a steep state of, state of decline where the individual birds make a difference to the overall health of, of the wild populations. So you got a sense of the things that were being recovered, um, magnolia warblers or catbirds, that, um, you know, there were many, many common birds, but there was also a lot of unusual birds there as well. And it just made the, the impact that much more grievous. Um, so the idea of having all these dead carcasses is not just to have a big pile of dead birds like that, but rather it's to have them organized and labeled. All the dead birds would go to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. Um, and Andy Jones, who until recently was the uh, curator of ornithology at the museum and Courtney Brennan would preside over an amazing group of volunteers there who would um, uh, create study skins or skeletonize um, and otherwise prepare these specimens so that they would be um, added to the scientific collection of the institution um, so that they're there for permanent reference and, and study. 
And, uh, it, you know, I believe um, the museum's collections have grown at least by 10 to 15 percent just with the addition of Lights Out Birds. So this is a collection that's been around since 1920. It's, it's increased in size by that much just in the, the five seasons we've done the uh, Lights Out Cleveland. And there you see the highly reflective and magnetic personalities of, the, of a morning crew out on um, uh, out in, in front of the Drury Hotel. Um, now, not all the birds are dead. The birds that are alive, again, are carefully bagged up and processed, and then they're taken to the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center, where they're evaluated, they're given fluids, um, they're stabilized, and it's really important. Oftentimes, if you ever see a bird that slammed into your window, your plate glass window, the thought is maybe you could somehow care for it for yourself. Well, it turns out, particularly through this experience of Lights Out Cleveland and the sheer volume of birds that Lake Erie Nature and Science Center has handled, is they've developed some amazingly successful techniques for successful rehabilitation of these birds. And there is definite first aid they need um, to make it more likely that they're going to be able to survive their injuries and be successfully released back to the wild. Um, and there's Tim and there's Janice there, and they're feeding, um, providing fluids to a bird. And they, have, <laughs> at the height of Lights Out Cleveland, there are aquaria all over the place um, that are housing birds. And then there are generally daily releases of the birds that um, can be uh, returned to the wild. Many of the birds over the years have been banded. And then also some have been fitted with uh, motus tags um, so that if they fly over a motus antenna, they will ping it and you will get a data dump of that individual bird as it passed over that antenna. And there is actually an antenna out the uh, Huntington Reservation. There's one on top of the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. And there's a growing network of these um, antennae uh, started up in Canada, but it's growing in the United States. And it's going to be a really important way of logging into the movements of these birds. So in the first four complete seasons and, and uh, 2020 and a little bit of 2021 were definitely impacted by COVID, like we canceled the 2020 spring season, but uh, 11,964 total bird recoveries as of last November, 3,726 live birds rescued, rehabilitated, and released by the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center and 8,238 specimens are now residing in the collections of the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. This is just an amazing tribute, again, to the, the volunteer monitors and the, the volunteer um, preparators at the Museum of Natural History and um, the folks that help out with the Wildlife Rehabilitation Program at the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. I mean, this is truly a volunteer citizen science effort, and it's reaping huge uh, rewards. Um, and as you now know, uh, 115 bird species over nine seasons and the top five species, white-throated sparrow, big time, uh, Lincoln sparrow next, then common yellow-throat oven bird and golden crown kinglet. Now we go back to that, well, what's the point of this? That we're, we're assembling a huge data set and that data set can be used to learn more about the nighttime movements of migratory birds, about their behavior, um, but the whole idea here was to, grab, to gain ammunition so that we could do what Chicago had done. In this upper picture, you see the Chicago skyline. And then at 11 o'clock down below, you see what happens when they turn the lights off. It's amazingly dramatic. And, um, and when you get the buy-in of the local community. So what the, the next part of Lights Out Cleveland has been trying to work with building owners and managers um, to get them to turn out the lights. And we've had a whole lot of people working on that, but one person we have to really give a shout out to is David Hollister, who is a local com commercial real estate broker who has helped open the doors to many C-suites to get us audiences with, um, with folks that can make a decision to enlist uh, a building. Um, this is the kind of thing that is disseminated, and we encourage building owners and managers to turn the lights off in spring and fall migration season from March 15th to June 1st, August 15th to November 1st. And we recognize that people, they illuminate their building to market their building, so we ask them to turn them off um, 
at, at least by midnight and keep them off all night long and through dawn. Do not turn them back on again. And the idea is not to extinguish essential lighting, um, lighting that's essential for security or protection, um, but there's an awful lot of light that is just waste light. And the extent that we can reduce that, exterior wash lighting, um, spot lighting, um, and then also trying to keep light inside. If they can keep lights off on a floor um, and if they're cleaning them at the nighttime, maybe they can clean them office by office and, and have only the light on that they need. Uh, the idea is you save birds, you conserve energy, and in the long run, you save money. These are our current participating buildings as of April, um, and we've got quite a few, and there's some there's some great buildings in there with 200 public square. That's the um, Huntington building or the BP building. Um, 55 public square is on the northwest corner of public square. Um, First Energy Stadium has signed up, Great Lake Science Center, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Progressive Field. Um, we have huge challenges in some of these places. We still have huge challenges, but at least we've gotten them to sign up where they recognize that there's a, um, a problem and that they're doing their best to at least pluck the low hanging fruit and turn off the lighting that they can. Sometimes the stadia have got issues with the, the nature of their LED lighting and, and when they can turn it on and off. Um, we know that there are other parts of the city, particularly the uh, um, Rocket Mortgage Field House with the renovations that were done in its atrium that are all glass. We know that that's a, a huge site of mortality and we're hoping to um, open up lines of communication um, to an awful lot of these places to see if we can um, work collaboratively and find out if there are ways that we can um, encourage them to add decals or other kinds of um, things that would mitigate the collision threat. Um, but I love this line from Susan Elgin. I don't love it, but it's so true. Light is what draws them in, but it's glass that finishes them off. Glass is the huge issue. I mean, this is a, a this is what's killing them. The birds are not flying into granite; they're flying into glass. Um, they're basically confused by the light. Um, a lot of them will make um, landfall at dawn in the little pocket park, parks and the green spaces that we have around the city of Cleveland. But then that puts them at tremendous risk because when you're down at ground level and you're looking up at the ground floor windows they have an incredible magnifying, and ref, not magnifying, but reflective thing. If you take a look over our casualty here, you see a reflection of the city block in the window beyond. Um, and you can see it here by the Global Center for Health Innovation. Um, I mean, you can see the Hilton, these upper floors are probably not as much of an issue to birds, but you can see how it just reflects the sky and how if you are a bird that is new to a city, that you have no context for being able to establish what glass is. Um, as uh, Dan Clem says, solid air, and you make a oft fatal mistake of trying to fly into the reflection, which you think is a continuation of the space that you're in. This whole idea about the juxtaposition of buildings with lots of glass to green space, we now know is a big one. So if you take a look at at the renovated public square and the very attractive green spaces there, if you're a migratory bird at dawn and you're tired, you've been flying all night long, you're looking to, to you know, take a break, get something to eat, uh, maybe something to drink, you can see how attractive this would be. And if you settle into those trees and as those trees get more mature, um, you're gonna be in a situation where you're right at these highly reflective windows, for instance, in the atrium, of 200 public square or down on the ground floors of Key Tower. And indeed, these are some of the areas we find lots of casualties. So on Key Tower over here, you don't find the casualties on the west side or on the north side. You find most of the casualties are on the south side facing the green space. So there's this is something that needs further study, but with this data set that we've got, this is strongly suggestive of the fact that birds are at greatest risk um, if they're utilizing these green spaces. Now, of course, think about the importance of those green spaces for 
for aesthetics in the city, for places for people to go and, and interact with nature. Um, when we think about the effort to uh, the Cleveland tree plan and the effort that the Western Reserve Land Conservancy and others are involved in, in trying to reforest the city, which is all really laudable goals. The only problem is if we create some of these parks and they're right next to these windows that don't have some kind of protection on them, we're gonna be setting up birds for, uh, for some really fatal outcomes. Um, another thing about public square, and you see it at uh, dusk here, um, is that if you look at the Northwest quadrant, that now parking lot is gonna be the pavilion of the brand new headquarters for uh, Sherwin-Williams. And we're all excited about the fact that Sherwin-Williams has really doubled down in this community to create um, uh, their global headquarters and to be a, 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 another a very dominant um, icon on the Cleveland skyline. But we are concerned about the plans for it because their two-story pavilion, which will be on that parking lot, faces public square with lots of glass and basically would be a recipe for um, lots and lots of bird strikes. And we have been trying to work with uh, both Sean Williams and the city of Cleveland to, to see if there's some way that we can encourage them um, to, to use uh, any kind of device that might mitigate the threat that that glass poses to migratory birds. Um, and this is a whole case in point when you take a look at a, you know, this view of downtown Cleveland, there's not a whole lot of green space that you see. I mean, you see uh, Erie Street uh, Cemetery down there by Progressive Field, which is a, an, an incredible magnet for birds and a great birding location. Those of you who have never birded it, in April and May, it just, I mean, seeing woodcocks during the daytime, um, I think I was there last um, early April and I think I counted 12 or 13 woodcocks that were um, spending the daytime in that, that uh, cemetery. But you can see the mall um, up uh, north of, uh, you can see Public Square. You can see that if you're a bird flying in a broad wave of migrants and it's dawn, you're going to be gravitating to whatever green space you see there. And that's going to put you in, um, in jeopardy with respect to windows of these buildings. So the, we know that glass is the issue and it might not be glass on floors 20 or floors 40. It's probably glass as you see in this right photo, that's reflecting all the trees and the bushes that are right around there. It's maybe the, the lower two floors. Uh, new ordinance in, in New York City is gonna be calling for bird friendly building designs um, up to 70 feet on um, build, new buildings, new construction. So that's clearly the, the place that we can have the greatest of impact and hopefully we can move toward that. So, the bottom line is urban lights attract and disorient migratory birds and morning feeding movements lead them to collisions with class. Those are the kind of the two overarching issues that we need to try and remediate. There are lots of great solutions to remediate. And this is a really neat story. Um, this is the, the law school library at Cleveland State and it was a bird killer and Jen McMillan, who is Director of Sustainability, I believe might be Head of Operations, Building Operations now for the, um, the university, but um, she got a, a Akron company to install these dots, these decals, and they're set in such a um, prescribed manner as the birds, they determined they cannot fly between the dots. The birds see it readily and they don't fly into the windows. And I understand that they've had almost 100% reduction in bird strikes on these windows since they use this treatment. Um, there's many other kinds of things. There are bird tapes. Um, there is the Ecopian bird savers, which are basically like strings that hang down. This is literally low tech stuff. They can move in, in the breeze, but the birds see them. They have to be in the outside surface of the glass. So they perceive them to be something solid. There's lots of other variations on, on a theme of using these tapes. Um, and this is not only true for big buildings, but this is also true for our houses too. Um, you can see, you can use this kind of film where if you're in the inside looking out, it's transparent, but from outside looking in, 
a bird would never think it could go through that. And actually, Matt's creating something through Ohio Lights Out of trying to uh, create a registry of homes where people are, are um, uh, showcasing their solutions for making the glass that they have in their house safer for migratory birds. Because this is not just a, a, a downtown Cleveland issue. There's wherever you have plate glass, you have casual bird casualties. Um, and um, this is something that we all have a stake in and we all can be part of the solution. Uh, with respect to what we can all do, this whole idea of rethink lighting, um, we don't have to be um, National Lampoon Christmas vacation um, and try and light every square inch. You know, so much of what we light is lost. It's just useless glare out there. And it's sometimes not aesthetically pleasing. It's a waste of energy. And the idea, whether it's doing it on a a skyscraper or an iconic building in the middle of a downtown city, or whether it's doing it in your own backyard, um, clearly rethinking lighting. Uh, keeping your cats indoors, I just, you saw the graphic, cats are a huge um, uh, non-natural source of mortality, and it's not feral cats either. The feral cats don't help us, and and um, the, the trapping and neutering and release programs don't touch this whatsoever those birds even though they can't i mean those cats even though they can't reproduce are certainly out there killing birds so keep cats indoors uh, cats are extraordinary creatures as i've learned thank you ov um but they belong indoors because they have a huge impact upon um wild species so what can we all do well here's a laundry list live a bird friendly life what's that mean landscape with native plants Get involved in citizen science. Um, you know, volunteer for local bird and conservation groups. Particularly, volunteer for Lights Out Cleveland. Uh, volunteer to be a monitor. Volunteer to prepare skins at the museum. Volunteer at Lake Erie Nature and Science Center, caring for the birds and helping release them. Um, but get involved in the, the the bird groups and the conservation groups, particularly at the local level, that are having an impact upon um, successful conservation strategies. We mentioned cats, keep cats indoors, support conservation actions locally, regionally, nationally, and globally. You know, that whole idea of think uh, global but act local is so true in this. We can only impact the things that we can, we have some influence on. And clearly, your yard, your home, is a place you have the ultimate control over and that you can affect all sorts of bird-friendly strategies there that will be reap benefits for not only birds, but pollinators and, and insects and native plants. And it's good for everybody. Um, while you're keeping an eye on the big picture and climate change and the other things and what's being done um, uh, more broadly, turn the lights out at any level. Nighttime illumination is, you know, it's just, um, not what it's made out to be. Um, and, and not only does it cause problems for birds, but of course, if you enjoy that great spectacle that's up there every night when we have clear skies of the stars and the Milky Way and the planets, um, light scatter from downtown, light pollution you know, robs us of that. Um, and you have to go way out in places like Eastern Geauga County to Observatory Park or other certified dark sky areas to be able to see the sky as it's meant to be. Use tape, decals, films, et cetera, to protect birds from glass, protect bird habitat, get involved in, in local um, uh, bird habitats um, with your you know, Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society, Kirtland Bird Club, Audubon Society of Greater Cleveland, and, and others um, support conservation organizations like Western Reserve Land Conservancy, Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and others. And so certainly support your local park system like Cleveland Metro Parks, and Lake Metro Parks, and others, because they're having a huge impact upon the conservation of, of habitat, which is so not only um, important for our native birds and birds like this red-headed woodpecker here, but certainly as staging areas um, for all of those migrants. Become informed. The more you know, the more powerful your voice is. Be a voice then for birds and nature and protect biodiversity. E.O. Wilson once said in, in saying that biodiversity was the greatest threat that we were um, to the planet that we were perpetrating, we humans. He said that if you really cared about biodiversity, you wouldn't let climate change happen because you'd be, look, you'd be concerned about preserving 
the biological diversity of the planet. So um, all good things to keep in mind and, and do. And I, I like to kind of end up these programs just taking it back out to, a, you know, maybe a, a 150,000 miles. But I love this, this image. I first saw this in a biomimicry seminar that was in at the museum back in the, the um, uh, 2007 or eight. And the image on the left is planet Earth. But you see that blue marble on it? Well, in this particular thought exercise, they said, if you took all of the surface water on planet Earth and coalesced it into a sphere, how big would it be compared to the volume of planet Earth? That's it. It's about the size of, I don't know, Central and Western Europe. And if you took the entire atmosphere of planet Earth and coalesced it into a sphere, it would be the thing on the right. It would be this size of, you know, probably three times the size of the water. And you might say, well, this is not possible. We're the water planet, 70% of the surface is covered with water. We have oceans with trenches that go down 36,000 feet or more. How can that be? Well, most of the ocean is not necessarily that thick or that deep when compared to the great volume of planet Earth. And when you look at those two spheres, think about it, that pretty much all life as we know it operates in those two spheres. And the earth is not the vast place we sometimes think it is. It's covered with this thin veneer, this biosphere. Look at that little haze of the atmosphere um, in this picture taken from the uh, shuttle. And, you know, life might go up 100,000 feet. Maybe it goes down seven, eight miles. Um, or more, but that's it. It's just this thin onion rind, this, the, the outer peel of the onion. And all life as we know it operates in that sphere. And it's not an unlimited system. It's an incredibly dynamic system. It's co-evolved with plants and animals and microbes and everything else to be very, very stable. And we humans have been the beneficiary of that. But we certainly run the risk of destabilizing it. We certainly destabilize it if we allow the loss of lots of species. Um, I leave you with this Baba Diom quote, in the end, we will conserve only what we love, we will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. And that's not classroom teaching, that's the, the, the teaching that um, informs us, that the, the seeking information, accurate information, not, not, uh, not the uh, uh, alternative facts, but to know how this planet works, know that we are a biological part of it. We cannot live without this, these systems. Birds are part of the ecological services that we depend upon and that we all have a stake in making sure that they are preserved um, for our grandchildren and our great grandchildren. Because I think that's the one thing is apparent is you never wanna see the world diminished to those who come after um, less than what you were able to explore and enjoy. And whenever we have to think about it could never happen to us, we just have to go back and look at the passenger pigeon and remember how we took the most numerous bird on planet Earth with a population of five to seven billion birds endemic to the forests of Eastern North America and basically in, in 75 years rendered them extinct. So um, I leave you this last slide to just lots of resources. Ohio Lights Out. Again, this is the initiative of the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative. You see their, their um, site up there, um, Lights Out Cleveland, and the information about Lights Out Cleveland can be found there in the pull-down menu. Uh, Lake Erie Nature and Science Center that does lots of great things, extraordinary education, but their wildlife rehabilitation program is fabulous. And, and Tim Jasinski, again, if it weren't for Tim, um, uh, this monitoring program would have never gotten off the ground. The Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and um, even though Andy is now the executive director of the Spring Island Trust in South Carolina, uh, I know Courtney Brennan is keeping the, um, uh, the, the program going in terms of um, processing the specimens from Lights Out Cleveland, and they're committed to that. Uh, Cleveland Metro Parks, and John Sepak and, and John Brumfield, Akron Zoo, um, and Lake Metro Parks, Lake Metro Parks, by the way, uh, Tammy O'Neill and the crew out there uh, take all the bats because there are migratory bats that come through Cleveland, hoary bats and, and red bats and the like. And many of them sometimes collide or get confused and, and they need to be rehabilitated. And Lake Metro Parks does a fabulous job there. 
and probably the mother load for information about these kinds of bird collision uh, light issues is the American Bird Conservancy. And they literally, Christine Shepard there, literally wrote the book on bird-friendly building design. They have a great resource, um, a multi-page resource about all of the, the different uh, tactics you can use to make glass bird friendly. Um, and they rate it, they've actually tested it, partly in, in uh, collaboration with the folks at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. So there's a wealth of information there. And we really encourage people to, to find out about these organizations and what they're doing. This is a, a, a really cool and very natural collaboration that um, wants to foster bird conservation in a bird friendly region. So with that, Thank you. Thank you, Harvey. Can you hear me, Harvey? I can hear you now. Okay. Apologies to everyone for any sound issues, but we do have a couple questions. So I'm going to um, feed those to you right now, Harvey. Um, okay. At the beginning of the presentation, you talked about the numbers of birds migrating in the fall. In, someone missed that number. How many birds migrate through the area in the fall? Uh, so the northern border, it's I think 2.7 move north in the spring and 4 billion come south in the fall. And then that number is amplified to I think 4.7 billion uh, crossing the southern transect down into Central America on the way to South America. Okay, excellent. Um, can Harvey address whether the incidental take regulations in the Migratory Bird Act will be applied to buildings that have a history of a large number of bird strikes? So that is beyond my pay grade. I mean, that is a that is a, a curious thing, and and you know there have been certain places with wind towers, uh, wind turbines, um, particularly at Altamont, where that was in fact employed because the, the Altamont wind turbines were claiming the lives of eagles that were protected under the Bald Eagle Act. Um, I do not know that though, the first step in that is accumulating data. And that's the one thing that is coming from this monitoring program is now there is a lot of data. Um, you know, 12,000, we're probably on our way to 13,000 birds. And that's a lot of birds. And we, we get far more specimens than the monitoring programs in other cities in Ohio. And that has to do with where Cleveland is, right on Lake Erie. We're just a major migratory route. And Lake Erie is a barrier. So a lot of birds, when they're coming you know, north in the spring, they're going to think twice about flying over Lake Erie. And maybe their you know, thought is, OK, well, I'm going to settle down and catch a meal and fatten up before I you know, fly over that bad boy out there, um, which means that they're that much more likely than to, to uh, settle in the city. Or likewise, in the fall, when they've crossed the lake and now they're tired and hungry, they're much more likely to land right in the city as soon as they make landfall. So our, our, the, our geography is uh, a, a big driver of the numbers that we see. Okay. Um, how does Cleveland stand with passing ordinances similar to what New York City has done? Well, I mean, this is something that we're hopeful going in, into the future that we might get some traction with, but there has been no discussion to date. Um, we have um, made lots of resources available to the folks at City Hall, um, particularly with the uh, incoming um, BIB administration. Um, and we're hoping that there might be a movement that we could uh, encourage people to support of uh, drafting some legislation. Because we now have Chicago's adapted this, New York City, Philadelphia's coming up with something. Um, Pittsburgh is, is declaring themselves bird safe, uh, Washington DC. There's actually um, Bird Safe Building Act in Congress um, that with the idea that all new federal construction would have to be bird friendly. And there, you know, other than saving birds, there is an energy conservation um, part of this too, but this is addressing really glass and the reflectivity glass at ground level. Okay, here's a good question from Dan Best regarding the downtown businesses that have not signed on with Lights Out Cleveland. Is it simply that they're not responsive or what excuses or rationale have been voiced for not getting on board with turning their lights out? 
Well, all of the above. Um, so I, th I think that there are some building owners who don't feel that there's a problem. It's kind of like, I don't see the problem. So I, I don't see carcasses all over my front stoop. So I don't see why I should change my operations at all. Um, and and it, it's been sometimes a tough sell, um, regardless of the fact that um, it's been embraced by um, organizations that represent building owners and managers in other cities. It sometimes hasn't been embraced here. So it's been something of an uphill struggle. Um, what we try and do, we try to be positive about this and we want to be able to, to heap praise upon the buildings that do enlist and that do abide by our guidelines because we think it's a, you know, a huge deal and, um, and that that will be attractive then to others. And we're hoping also that for folks that live in downtown that you know, are, are renting in any number of the, the places down there that we're hoping that there's a, a groundswell of support for more sustainable living in downtown and that they might try and encourage the building owners to whom they're paying rent to make sure that their buildings are sustainable. Okay. Um, Kathy Fouts asks, how were the Indians able to get rid of the gulls? Ooh, this was good. This is, so it turns out that um, they, the gulls again would be, they start assembling around seven o'clock and generally at the seventh inning stretch, they would fire off a, 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 a test firework, not one of the little home run ones, but one, one of the big boys from the, um, the top of the local uh, parking garage. And it was noticed that the birds all took to the air. And so what we recommended to the, the Indians is that they just, you know, launch a firework, you know, every half inning. And that that would be enough to dissuade the gulls. And, and indeed, it, it worked and worked very effectively. Excellent. Excellent. We had a, um, a question about cats. Harvey, do you have any um, suggestions on how folks can keep neighbor cats away from their bird feeders? I don't. Um, you know, if you can get to, get to people and encourage folks to, you know, put a collar with bells or put those, you know, those really hideous scrunchies that people used to wear in their hair, rainbow colored from, you know, like the 70s, uh, that has supposedly some sort of a deterrent effect. Um, but it's tough. Uh, it, it, it really is tough. And that when you have neighborhood cats and you know that they're people's pets, they're not feral. And they come into your yard and they're patrolling, you know, uh, I have been known to haze the cat in my neighborhood that does this. So when the hose is handy, um, that cat gets a bath. I don't try and damage it, but I want to make sure that it's a pretty negative experience. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> um, regarding the lights, are any lights worse than others? Do birds see all color of the spectrum in the same way? Um, there is some suggestion that maybe green lights are safer than red, um, but there's not, uh, I think the jury is still out on that, um, or the difference between, you know, uh, LED lights and, and other types of light. Um, I'm not sure that there's been any kind of a comprehensive study of that, um, with wild birds at least. Okay. And the problem is just as bad with um, buildings in the buildings suburbs, in the suburbs. Correct. correct? Absolutely. I mean, this is, so we've had, um, and think about buildings, industrial parks that are glazed. Um, we've had issues out at uh, Chagrin Boulevard by um, Interstate 271. There's a lot of, comp the Cleveland Clinic's got a complex. There's lots of things. Um, sometimes wa elevated walkways that are a story up or two stories up that are highly reflective glass birds just you know they're coming out of a tree and they have absolutely no idea that it's solid and that's it's this is huge so this whole idea about lights out this is anybody can enlist you know any anybody can enlist their buildings and we encourage folks to do so and this is really a, an educational awareness thing as much as anything else is just to if we're aware of it that we can take the steps that we need to take to at least have some impact on the problem Okay, we have one last question. 
Do you have any um, suggestions on how someone may persuade their employer to install window deterrence and strategies to protect birds? Well, I don't know that I have, you know, I, I worked at the same place for 46 and a half years. So, you know, I don't have a whole lot of experiences with working with other uh, regimes. I'm very, very pleased that the Museum of Natural History in its new construction is going to have bird-friendly glass, fritted glass, which is, a, you know, um, I would have been very disappointed if they weren't, but I, 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 kudos to them. That's a, that's a great part of the the new edition, the capital edition they're doing. Um, it's it's trying to make your, you know, the, your, the, the company that you work for um, just aware of the problem and see that if they might have some, any kind of interest in it. Um, you know, it would be fun to talk to Jen McMillan about, did she just have the money in her budget to be able to do that retrofit of the law school library? Cause she was, it was brought to her attention that they were killing lots of birds. And um, and so she sought to do something about it. Um, I know that we've had um, people have reached out to Lights Out Cleveland um, from Dealer Tire and a couple other places that are looking to do the same thing. So it's a mad matter of getting the word out and getting those educational resources and just you know encouraging them that, that this is important. It doesn't matter where your building is, this is important, particularly in line with this notion of we all need to do our part that um, you know, it's a, a death by a thousand cuts if each building, you know, that might be a two-story building, it's not a skyscraper, it's not in downtown, it's out in the outering suburbs and you know, maybe it's not so much a problem there. Everything um, collectively um, equals a major problem. Well, thank you, Harvey. Hey, you're welcome. Thanks for the opportunity. You betcha. Everyone have a lovely evening. Bye-bye now. So can you hear me? I can hear you. Was that okay? What? Mute, mute your... Oh, here.